So what I hope, uh, if there's one thing I can, I, I hope to kind of convince you of in this session, it's not that Salesforce is the, be the best tool uh, and that you should absolutely use that over something else. Uh, I'm not, uh, I have no, I'm not married to Salesforce. Uh, I know a lot about it because I've been using it since 2006 uh, and administering systems and ultimately kind of consulting with helping other organizations to use Salesforce. Uh, but what I do, what I do want to actually try to convince you of, and, and this may be hard, but what I want to try to convince you of is that Salesforce can be as powerful for an organization for doing these things, program management and grant management, um, as, and impact measurement as it can for managing your fundraising, your donors, your events, your memberships. Uh, and so actually we're probably not going to talk too much about those things. We're probably going to talk more about how we actually use uh, technology, Salesforce in this case, to better manage what we do as an organization and how we understand the impact of the work that we're doing. And apologies for my American accent that you're going to have to put up with um, while I have the microphone. This is, um, so basically my background, I, when I, in 2008 I moved to South Africa. Um, and I was working for a nonprofit uh, that was doing HIV prevention education work. Uh, and this is how we were tracking our data. Uh, this looked familiar to, not this specific spreadsheet, but probably this approach probably looks familiar to you guys. So the interesting thing here, we actually had, and you can see the data from 2008, we had fantastic uh, data for fundraising. We had a really good Salesforce system in place that I was managing for uh, tracking our donors and our donations and our fundraising events. And we had, you know, at the CEO's fingertips, we had great data. We had dashboards kicking out to everybody in the organization that was doing fundraising. But then when I moved over to South Africa as like the, the data guy, uh, which they called, you know, monitoring and evaluation and, and research, um, this was kind of, this was what I inherited, was, was basically a, a, a system that you had a, a one-way flow of data from the field to the local office to the headquarters uh, in Cape Town, in this case, to the funder. And what, what the system consisted of was a lots of spreadsheets, like the one you saw. So every, every three months, you would get spreadsheet from every site, and we had like 20 different sites that would email in these, these spreadsheets, if we were lucky, uh, to, to the head office every, every three months. Uh, and obviously that, that, has, that has problems with it. But then the worst part of this was you had one person uh, that sat sort of on top of this pyramid uh, and, and he was the data guy. He was the person who you go to to answer the questions about how many, how many kids did we reach f with this grant uh, and that would feed into the grant report. And so there's a lot of problems associated with that, right? We, had to, we were about to get a grant from the US government to go from 5,000 kids a year to 50,000 kids a year just in South Africa. And this system doesn't scale, right? This, this system of email the spreadsheet to, to one person doesn't scale very well. But there's deeper problems. So what, what I did, which I think was smart, and if you guys are ever kind of looking into, frankly, any sort of digital transformation within your organization, I would recommend that you start by just asking really good questions and then listening. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, I was 22, uh, and I didn't, it wasn't that anyone had sort of told me that's what, how you should do digital transformation, and I had no idea what digital transformation meant, let alone. But I went out to talk to the folks that are collecting the data, that are entering all this data, just to understand their experience of how they were, you know, how they were going through this, and also how did the data get into this in the first place? And actually, you know, what it turned out was they, you know, they would take the best facilitators who were actually delivering the program, and they would sit for three days nonstop and just punch data in, into spreadsheets uh, at the end of that three months. So, you know, clearly that's not a good strategy to employ as an organization if you're truly impact, impact driven. So what we did was we completely changed it, right? Uh, you, you had the system where, you know, mistakes are getting made uh, every level, right? People are aggregating poorly or counting incorrectly. Um, and the, the biggest thing that we saw was there were no feedback loops and that was, it was just demotivating for staff. So we were asking a lot for people, three days of head down data entry work every three months. Uh, you're not, you know, for people who are really want to be in the schools and working with the kids. Uh, and we also weren't giving them, there was no feedback loop to say, you know, great job or here's how we're doing. And so what we did is we overhauled that. I had the wacky idea in, at the time in 2008 of doing it on Salesforce. Uh, and we built one of the, one of the early Salesforce based monitoring and evaluation systems. So tracking our program, tracking all the kids in the program, tracking their changes in knowledge related to HIV, tracking their attendance, uh, whether they're getting tested for HIV, referred to treatment, and so forth. And you can imagine how that changes the organization. Instead of one person on top of the data pyramid, you actually had a much flatter structure. You democratize data within the organization and everybody can start to answer questions that are, that are relevant to them and to the, their team. Um, also kind of became kind of gamified in a way, right? And data visualization at its best will, will help to gamify things. It'll get people kind of looking at the data and thinking, how are we stacking up? How are we doing? How about those guys, right? Uh, or how about these, these, these gals on the other team? And that was happening. Data started to become, you know, a water cooler kind of, 
uh, conversation. Uh, how, how are we doing it? What's our data look like? So basically what started happening from there was other organizations started, caught wind of the system and said, hey, like, can we take a look at that? This concept of using Salesforce for monitoring and evaluation was a bit foreign. Uh, and so they would come to us and say, this is exactly what we need, but we uh, work in after school programs or we work with orphans and vulnerable children or we manage grants, you know, uh, just lots of different use cases. Uh, and it was, it was beyond the mission of what our organization was set out to do. So what we ended up doing was a couple colleagues and I uh, spun out a B Corp uh, called Vera Solutions from the organization we were working uh, with um, and worked basically to help those organizations solve their problems, get off of their spreadsheets, get onto the cloud, get off of paper, onto mobile. Uh, and we've grown over the last, uh, well, that was 2009 we started doing this work, 2010 we started Vera, and we've since worked uh, with about 300, almost 300 organizations uh, and grown to a team of almost 60 uh, around the globe. Uh, and so that's, we're a little bit unique, I guess, in, in this conference in the sense that we're, we do have a team here in London, but we're not specifically just focused on, on the UK. Um, and so those are your, you know, Classic logo slide. If you guys want to talk about any of these projects, happy to, happy to talk about them. The one thing I would say is there's a big spectrum of organizations we've worked with. So everything from small community-based organizations to medium-sized nonprofits, international nonprofits, and then also doing kind of grant management systems with, uh, with funders like uh, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation or the Elton John AIDS Foundation here in London or the Shell Foundation uh, and others. Um, so here's a, just a quick video just to get the sort of white American guy's voice off of the um, off of the mic uh, and put it in the user's perspective. Hang on. Clinic Care Africa is a for-profit social enterprise based in Nairobi, Kenya. The company was founded with the idea of having a for-profit company that could provide opportunities to smallholder farmers throughout Kenya and East Africa. We use Salesforce in conjunction with a mobile application called TaraWorks that connects data that we gather from the field directly to our Salesforce database in real time. Judy Kilimo has built its system around Salesforce platform. The impact it has had on farmers is quite big. Farmers are now able to use a mobile payment and uh, the system is able to enable our business uh, development officers to refer and be able to apply loans or automatically using the system. So what we do at Sanergy is that we franchise low-cost, high-quality sanitation facilities to people living in the communities who run them as small businesses. Salesforce enables us to then track everything about this entrepreneur. So we have the operational data, how many users are going, how much waste is being collected, and whether that entrepreneur is succeeding. We really are transforming a community. It's actually changing what the community feels like, thinks about itself, and what it aspires to become. Okay. So that's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a Salesforce. They've got a better marketing team than, than, um, than we have. Um, no no uh, disrespect to our, our, our marketing team of, of one person. Um, but they can make cool videos like that. But what it, it, I mean, I think it's, it, what's interesting with, um, you know, with, with these organizations is they really kind of went from Google Sheets and paper and lots of different tools kind of onto one central tool that they're running, they're actually running their operations from. It's not about how do we track our donors or track this part of what we do. Um, they're actually tracking kind of their core, their core operations and, and managing their organizations on, on Salesforce. And again, that theme of feedback loops I think is, uh, is pretty important. The other thing, you, you, saw, you actually saw a couple things in there that weren't Salesforce. Um, so you saw a mobile app called TerraWorks that I'll talk more about in a sec. Um, you saw a mapping app. And I think one of the important things with Salesforce is to understand that it's not, people think about Salesforce and they think about CRM software. And in fact, there's a lot of Salesforce is actually the platform, but it's also the, the ecosystem around that platform. So you have uh, a, a massive ecosystem of, of apps, consultants, developers that are really extending what, what Salesforce can do. Why we build on Salesforce, uh, I'm not going to give you kind of the salesy language of, it is, it is, it's number one in the sense of it's the most, it has the, the best penetration of CRM tools. Uh, out there, but what's what's relevant is that you've got you know almost 35,000 nonprofits now using using Salesforce around the globe, and so what that in terms of an ecosystem is really powerful because if Salesforce doesn't handle your currency question, you can literally just Google like currency conversion Salesforce, and you'll have lots of different people's thoughts and correct answers around how was this resolved in this context, and in many cases that'll be for coming from nonprofits as well. 
um, it's constantly innovating and, and improving. They're, they're making the platform considerably better every, uh, every four months or so. They have massive upgrades, and it's come a really long ways since I started on it uh, 12 years ago. Um, and you, you guys probably already know that there's a, a program to give 10 free licenses to any nonprofit, and then it's about a 75, 80% discount on their corporate rates. Uh, what I will say as somebody who doesn't work for Salesforce, although at risk of this being videotaped, uh, basically so you could have a PhD in Salesforce licenses and there's still a lot to, there's still a lot to learn, right? Um, the, the reality is if you go to Salesforce and say, hey, we want licenses, they will come and take the top shelf licenses and say, here are your licenses. They're the, ex the most expensive licenses that they sell. Uh, if you ask specifically for the licenses that you need, uh, they will give you those licenses. And in fact, if you want to use the Salesforce platform, which is what you would use if you're using it for grant management, project management, and program management, in other words, you're not using the sales part of Salesforce, you're using the Salesforce platform, the licenses actually cost six times less. Uh, we're talking kind of like 58 quid per year per user. Um, at least that's what it is right now. So something to just keep in mind. Happy to chat more about that. So this, I think, is just an important visual to take home. So I, for me, this is the real kind of why do we build on Salesforce or why do we like Salesforce, is that you have all of these layers and you can configure on these layers without writing a line of code, which means that you know, an administrator in your organization can pick up how do I create workflow or automation so that when this thing happens, I fire out an email to this, people, this person or this group of people. Um, you, know, you can structure the relational database to capture what you need it to capture or want it to capture. You don't need to go to developers to do that. There's lots of really good online resources um, through their kind of interactive uh, learning platform called Trailhead, which is uh, it's basically like Duolingo for Salesforce, which is kind of cool. Um, but anyway, you can kind of learn how to do any, any and all of this uh, using, using Trailhead. But so you've got this core relational database platform, right? You can configure what gets captured, what gets managed on that, on that platform with clicks, not with code. You can automate, so you can say rules for you know, what should happen when certain things happen in the database. You can also build out approval processes for things that should go through, let's say, stages of approval. The UI is super flexible and it's gotten a lot better, I would say, in, in the last three years in particular. You can really drag and drop it to make it look the way that you want it to look and, and you want it to feel. You also have really good drag and drop report, reporting wizards and dashboard building tools. Um, so you can, uh, within Salesforce, it's not the most powerful tool available in terms of data viz, but within Salesforce itself, you can do a lot of, uh, a lot of analytics without paying more for an, another data visualization tool. You've got a social layer, so basically you can move conversations off of email and onto the data itself, which sound, that may sound kind of tacky, but actually is like super helpful when you think about you know, the fact that who works at your organization two years from now is going to be some of the people that are working there now, but a bunch of other people who are not going to have context uh, for you know, what happened with this grant or this relationship or this program or this beneficiary. Uh, and so being able to have conversations and, and sharing, uh, you know, sharing uh, perspectives on the, the social layer of Salesforce can be really helpful. Uh, you can also, without spending more, you can just use Salesforce on a mobile device uh, and everything that you build in the cloud automatically just works on a mobile device and, and in a user-friendly way. And then underlying all of that, you've got you know, world-class security. You can, you can set up sharing and permissions to um, make sure that, the peop that people have access to the right data and don't have access to the data they shouldn't have access to, that they can do what they should be able to do and don't, can't do what they shouldn't be able to, be able to do. Uh, you can translate it into lots of different languages if you need to. And then communities we can take a look at later. Uh, anyone using Salesforce communities? We're about to. About to. And what are you going to use it for? For our volunteers. Cool. Yeah, it's a great use case for communities. So communities is like an external portal where you can, you can kind of take a slice of your data and share it with this person or this organization uh, and let them collaborate on that data and collaborate on Chatter as well with you and with your, the staff at your organization. So in a nutshell, that's kind of why we... <laughs> Uh, why we like to build on Salesforce. Uh, I mentioned mobile. Um, it is worth taking a peek if you guys uh, are interested in learning more about kind of mobile data collection and how it can feed into Salesforce. There's an awesome tool called TerraWorks uh, where you can build forms in Salesforce, push them out to mobile devices, and then your staff in the field or volunteers in the field can, uh, on an Android phone or tablet, can collect data offline and feed it into the system from their, from their phone. Um, super, it's a great tool. There's another tool called Formula that's, that does some, some similar things. Um, if you have good data, if you have good internet connection on your, on your mobile devices, uh, the Salesforce mobile app is also not too bad uh, for, for managing data. But you can kind of feed in you know, your, your data from TerraWorks, feed all the way straight up to, to dashboards uh, you know, that, that you're running in Salesforce. So people at the office can kind of sit in this space, but people who are out kind of running the program can actually collect data point of service on a phone and feed it into the system. 
It's a, it's a paid app, uh, and they do it, you, you can find their pricing on their website, on, on the TerraWorks website. They've actually just revisited their pricing to try to make it more attractive and appropriate for smaller nonprofits. Um, cool, so in the impact measurement space, we've basically seen organizations asking a lot of the same questions, right? Like how many, how many people are we reaching? Uh, who are we reaching? What's the thematic or geographic breakdown of who we're serving, who we're working with? Um, you know, where are we at in terms of delivering the milestones or activities that we've committed to on, on a grant or, or in this project? Where are we getting the best bang for our buck in terms of our cost effectiveness? Are we ultimately achieving the, the outcomes that we're setting out to achieve? Um, and, you know, basically working on these questions for the last eight years, by 2014, 2015, we had started to see some real common denominators in terms of what organizations needed when it came to program management and impact measurement on Salesforce. So we designed and built uh, an app called AMP Impact, which is also uh, like TerraWorks. It's on the Salesforce App Exchange, so you can find it there. Um, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a live demo of it as well, but there's also kind of videos of it online. The background, so this is kind of the background I was just, I was just talking through. We launched it actually just in 2017. So it's a fairly young um, app, but it's, it's already being used by a couple dozen organizations. Um, in uh, more than 25 countries. Um, and it's pretty cool because what it does is it just gives you a whole layer and structure, uh, vetted structure on top of Salesforce for tracking results and targets and indicators and projects and programs uh, that you, you just don't have. Otherwise, you'd be working with developers or consultants to start to build half of that. So the reason we did this was because we got sick of doing the same thing over and over again. We realized that we were, we were, developing, you know, we, we were basically delivering the same solution and there was this 80% overlap and it would be better for everybody if we just had a package solution. So that's, so that's kind of the backstory behind AMP Impact. Um, the cool thing with AMP and with Salesforce is that you don't need one tool to solve everything for you. You can bring data in from lots of tools. I mentioned TerraWorks, but you've got Comcare, you've got Kobo, Toolbox, ODK. Um, these, most of these are mobile data collection tools, but there's lots of, you know, a lot of options. For, you know, form Assembly is a really good web form tool or for, form stack. Um, Telerivet's a good, there's actually a bunch of different good SMS tools that integrate with Salesforce if you want to do that. Um, you can connect to SharePoint or Box or basically wherever you might be managing your files, you can connect that into Salesforce. Uh, and then you can also get data out when it comes to kind of data visualization. So uh, really kind of endless possibilities here, but I would say, uh, and we should certainly have Einstein Analytics as, as a, another option, which is Salesforce's data visualization offering. Um, but like Power, I, th I think Power BI is a great tool. Tableau is like a fantastic tool. It's a little bit expensive, but it's, it's really a fantastic tool. Uh, that you can definitely learn with a little bit of practice and watch it, watching a video. It's very drag and drop to be able to develop just some amazing visualizations that go beyond what you can do with Salesforce uh, kind of out of the box. Um, so you can also just get data to Excel if you just need it to Excel to, to get it somewhere else or, or you know, prep for the board meeting or whatever the case may be. So, so that's kind of that, that whole story. And then you, you know, you've got 4,000 apps on the App Exchange that can extend Salesforce. So when it comes to mapping or it comes to you know, other web form tools, it comes to data you know, deduplication or mass email, you don't need one tool to try to solve everything for you. And if, you've got, you know, if you're betting on Dynamics, you're kind of waiting for Microsoft to build that functionality. Whereas if you're using Salesforce, you've got this huge ecosystem of folks that are building their own proprietary apps that integrate with or sit on top of the Salesforce platform. So anyway, so this is, this is AMP um, uh, and, and in, a, in a little demo org. Um, so you, you'll basically see, you know, uh, for folks familiar with Salesforce, this is what Salesforce looks like at the top. This is just kind of native Salesforce. You have some new objects in Salesforce or entities, if you're, if you're familiar with that kind of that terminology, uh, for projects, indicators, geographic areas, strategic initiatives, and so forth. So this is what AMP is going to kind of bring in in terms of a data structure. If you drill into a project, this is the Sangay Novo project. So we've got all the details about uh, this particular project. Uh, and then we can see there's lots of different dimensions for this project that we can, that we can drill into. We can go all, you know, kind of see the information that they're publishing to uh, Ayati. This is, uh, based, this is a prototype we built for SOS Children's Villages. Um, and then we've got our setup. So we can tag this project with different strategic initiatives or, or thematic areas that we're working towards. So if I want to say this is, you know, we're working on advocating for children, we can just connect that in. Um, we can see different allocations, so which funders are funding this project, or if I'm a donor, or if I'm a grant maker, who, what other funders might be funding this organization or this grant that we're, that we're um, supporting? Do we have implementing partners? And the nice thing with Salesforce, this, if you're familiar with it, this is just, this is native Salesforce, but it's a data structure on top of native Salesforce. So if you say implementing partners aren't relevant for us, 
literally it's like 30 seconds to just pull to just pull that away, right? It's not technical work that you need a developer or a consultant to do. Um, you've got geographic areas. So what are the different geographic areas that this project's working in? This is one in Guinea-Bissau. Um, you've got reporting periods. So and this is a simple example where you've got annual reporting periods. Um, and so then you can, we can pop over. I'll just show kind of a quick spin around some of the other features. So log frames, so you can structure your impacts, outcomes, outputs, uh, or just your objectives that you're aiming to achieve on this project or in this grant or in this program. You can connect indicators to those objectives that you're, that you're setting out. And you can see that all of those in a, in a logical hierarchy. You've got, uh, stick with indicators for a minute. So you've got really rich indicator functionality. So we can see, <coughs> we can see, excuse me, all of the indicators that are relevant for this project to, to be reporting on. So number of um, district officials trained in standards of family-based alternative care. And that's a number indicator and it has all these attributes about it. You can also bring in indicators from a catalog of standard indicators. So if you're using kind of your own standard indicators that might cut across projects or grants, you can bring those into this grant. Um, you can also add custom indicators. And the, we don't have to dwell on this unless you guys want to, but what, what I see a lot of organizations do is for them an indicator is just like a column in a spreadsheet or like a row in like a Word doc table. And like you actually need all of this information when you're creating an indicator. It, you, the indicators have lots of metadata um, that need to be captured, everything from are we aiming to increase or decrease this indicator, like what is the data type of this indicator, what's the frequency that it's going to be reported on. And the beauty of AMP is it's then going to take that metadata and structure how it asks people to report on that indicator or where it pulls the data for that indicator. Um, so once you've set those up, you can set targets and you can add in results. So results are kind of per period of time and then uh, per geographic area. So we can see for this indicator, as we, you know, we punch in the numbers, it'll sum up and some across, and it's got a little bit of a feedback loop there on how we're doing with this, this stoplight. Um, yeah, you can capture comments about you know, why the results were particularly good or why the results you know, didn't, didn't meet um, expectations. Uh, you can disaggregate indicators in different ways. So this one is disaggregated by sex and by age. Others are not disaggregated at all. So you basically have flexibility to structure uh, indicators the way you need them to be. Um, and then the other cool thing you can do is aggregate up. So if you have, let's say, individual beneficiary data, you can bring that up to the AMP, the AMP impact data structure for results. Uh, so maybe you use AMP to set your targets, but the result data actually comes up from individual level data that you're collecting in TerraWorks or another tool. Uh, obviously, you can ca you know, uh, attach any files associated with this report. You could download this to Excel. You can upload it back from Excel, and it'll suck all your data up from there. So you can have people that are outside of Salesforce uh, working on the data. Uh, when you're ready, you can click Submit, and then it'll kick off any kind of workflow. It'll say, hey, you know, uh, portfolio manager, or hey, like program director, this report has been submitted. Here's a link. Take a look. Uh, and it can bring them straight to a dashboard or straight to a report or straight to this record. There's like a level that Salesforce administrators get to where you know how to build custom fields, but you don't know how to like design a proper like normalized data model. Uh, I don't know if that resonates at all, but because I, like I, w I was there early or like early in my days of being an administrator, actually for quite a while. Um, and so you end up with these, you know, these objects that just have like hundreds of fields on them, right? Uh, and so what's nice here is it's, it's normalized, right? So you can create another indicator and a different indicator and then have the logic for this indicator be different for the logic for that indicator and achieve an interface that's friendly in all circumstances, depending on disaggregation logic, if it's a percent or a currency or, or what have you. Uh, so that's kind of, that's how AMP works on that front. We've built like a similar narrative reporting uh, structure within AMP where you can just build out a template for any kind of narrative report that might come through from uh, a grant application to a due diligence form to an intake form, um, but where you're not going to just build fields and then try to maintain, you know, that structure, but you actually can build out, um, you actually can build out a form and then just assign a form to, to somebody. Um, we may be tight for time, so we'll see if we get to that. Um, you've got some performance graphs uh, right within AMP, so this is kind of nice because you don't have to configure a, da you can obviously configure a dashboard, but it lets you see your results against your targets over time for this particular project for the indicators that you select. So you can pick up to nine indicators that you want to see, and then you can just dump those into an image or a PowerPoint or an email. Um, you've also got structures within AMP Impact to manage your budget and expenditure. So if you've got another ERP tool or another kind of accounting tool, you can bring that data into, into Salesforce and into AMP Impact. Um, right now we're working on building functionality that will be available in the spring for uh, safe Harbor uh, for downloading uh, like a budget template, filling it in and then uploading it, similar to what we have for results. Um, so that'll be nice because you can just, people don't want to build their budgets in, in, in a 
funky online tool. They'd rather build their budgets in Excel, if you're like me. Um, and then you can manage your disbursements. So you can say, okay, uh, here's the, the schedule of who, like what's coming in from the, from the funder or what's going out to our grantees or our sub-grantees um, in, in a nice schedule here and then just update the status of those uh, disbursements when they go out. And again, it's Salesforce, so you can set up you know, those processes or workflows or approvals that you need. AMP isn't gonna tell you this is how approvals work in your organization, uh, but you can connect with other organizations and see how, see how they're doing it and, and learn from their examples. And then Chatter, I guess if, for those who don't know Chatter, you can just move, as I was mentioning, you can kind of have conversations on a, a piece of data itself. So on this record, I can come in and you know, chat to somebody uh, it can get, it'll go straight to their email. They can reply to that email. It'll come back to the system. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a nice little feature uh, right within Salesforce. Um, maybe one other thing to show just in a, in a totally different context is um, AMP in a, grant management, uh, in a grant management context. So this is Salesforce communities. So this is like an external portal um, we've built for the, for the WHO here where they're tracking, instead of projects, they're tracking awards. It's the, same, it's the same structure. What we found is the sector has massive alignment, much more than you would think in terms of what is actually needed, right? The, the taxonomies are really similar between grant makers and implementers. The terminologies are not aligned at all when you go from geogra one geography to another or one type of organization to another. Everybody's kind of making up what we call these things, whether it's logic models or log frames or logical frameworks or, or, or what have you. But the, the structures are actually very, very similar. Um, and so what you'll see is actually a lot of the, the, same, the same structure. So if you drill into a particular, you know, a particular grant here, you'll see kind of that same, that same structure that, that AMP gives you. This is a fairly, uh, fairly simple one. I can show you another community. Um, yeah, so, um, but you can, you can, oh, hey, that's fun. Demo gods don't like me. So you can set up, uh, yeah, so you can kind of, <clears throat> uh, you can expose data to external stakeholders, could be donors, could be board members, could be whomever. And actually coming back to the Salesforce license pricing, the community's licenses are even cheaper than the, the platform licenses. So if you have, let's say, partners that you work with, you don't need to think about like, well, we can't give everybody access to Salesforce. Because in fact, you just set up a, a community. This is all kind of drag and drop, really simple to, simple to build. Um, and you can open up that data. They can come in and collaborate on that results page just like anybody else, just like anybody within your organization could. Um, and you can give them a slightly different interface that they're gonna, that they're gonna use from somebody else's, but very similar, similar type of structure. So that's AMP, uh, that's AMP in, a, in a nutshell uh, in terms of what that sort of brings in and gives you sort of out of the box to, to work with on, on Salesforce. Salesforce and Microsoft have kind of worked together to create what they call Files Connect, which is a connection between Salesforce and SharePoint. So that's, in terms of like where we were four years ago or three years ago, we now have that, which is great because you can manage your files in SharePoint and they could be available and searchable within Salesforce. Uh, if you're an organization that really wants to be document driven, it makes sense to try to run your organization around SharePoint. If you're an organization that wants to become data driven, Salesforce has advantages over, over, certainly over SharePoint and arguably over, over Dynamics. Um, well, you can, I mean, I can show you kind of examples here where we can kick out data from AMP into an Excel spreadsheet that's formatted nicely. Um, you can download any kind of report from Salesforce in, uh, in an Excel, um, in, in a, you know, a nicely formatted Excel. So, you know, here we have like a, an example dashboard. You know, from a dashboard, I can click into a report um, but when, when the report comes up, you have any, any report from Salesforce, you can just click export and you can export it into an XLS or a CSV. Um, and that's, that's pretty, pretty basic. And the report builder in Salesforce is, you know, it's just drag and drop. So it's very simple to kind of set up tables or charts, you know, in the, the way that you might want to. So yeah, you can integrate, uh, you can integrate with all those tools, but I would say from a SharePoint integration point of view, there's a little bit to be desired. Files Connect does the basics of it, so if I search for a file here, I can, I can find it from, uh, from Files Connect. But in terms of kind of really bringing in that data structure uh, that's associated with my folders in SharePoint, there's some, we're working on that right now with AMP Impact, um, but there's, there's definitely some, some work, to be, to work to be done. This is just the download feature I was mentioning here. You can just export. And you can you know, structure, structure that as, as you want. We've built out this submissions functionality here. Let's see if we have one. Nope, we don't have one in this example. 
I think we've got one in this one. Bear with me. It's much better to, it's much better to see than for me to just tell you about it. So you can set up a template for questions that you want to be that you want to have answered. So we've we've got this template builder, and you can say, okay, I want a template that's a, uh, that's related to a beneficiary, or a template that's going to be filled out for the project, or a template that's going to be filled out for a grant report. Uh, and so you can select any object in Salesforce, so any type of data that you want to connect it to. This org has a lot of different objects in it. Um, and then you can structure out the questions that you want to have answered. And these questions can be qualitative, or pick lists, or numbers. So if I click on editing one of these, you just have a nice little wizard. I'll zoom in. You have a nice little wizard here for and kind of structuring out the question that you want to the question that you want to ask. So the description of it is it required? What's the data type? Uh, should we include comments? What are the pick list options? Uh, and then when it comes to then submitting the assess the, that submission rather, you have. This, this structure here, right? So it'll, it'll give you a, a nice interface that you can use in your portal or your community, uh, or you can use elsewhere within your Salesforce system. You can assign somebody this submission, so it can say, you know, please fill out this form, uh, and it'll take them straight to this form. They can answer out the questions and then submit it when they're ready to submit. They can also download, this is kind of an example of the Microsoft connections that I was, that I was getting at. Like, you can download from this into a Word doc if you want to. Um, A little bit different, yeah. More flex. This is a little bit more flexible um, than surveys. Surveys also like it, this comes with AMP, whereas surveys is if you use more than I think two of them or whatever, they start they start charging you per survey. The question types are pretty limited in sur in, in surveys. This is completely editable. It's completely editable. Yeah. You also there's some review functionality in here that's that's quite that's quite nice. But surveys, yeah, surveys is, is cool. It's like it's a pretty simple. So the point here is like if you if you have a submission that comes in, you want a reviewer to capture comments about what was submitted. They can score the questions and capture any comments. Um, and so that's kind of the that's the functionality that's been built out here. You can then also turn that into a radar chart, so you can kind of see how are we doing across the different dimensions. Very common cases, you're doing a capacity assessment uh, of your staff or capacity. So it could be a good HR tool, um, but you you want to see a radar chart on different competencies or different skill sets. And you can you can um, you can do that. Let's see if I can find an example of one. AMP or no AMP, I would recommend uh, look, looking for a partner, uh, a Salesforce partner that you can that you can work with, uh, or or even with like a even with an individual. But a partner is nice because uh, you have a little bit of a, a little bit more sort of uh, accountability, I guess, with them. There's a pretty good ecosystem of partners uh, here in in the UK. Um, you know, we're we're one of them, but there's there's many other non, uh, like nonprofit focused Salesforce partners, um, and so you can find folks that uh, kind of know a lot about the kind of way that you want to use Salesforce. And what I would say is like even one session with a partner will have a massive return on investment in terms of steering you in kind of the right direction. And everybody in the ecosystem, the last thing any people who see what Salesforce can do, and in our case, we've seen the way it can transform you know hundreds of organizations that we've worked with. Uh, the last thing any of us want is somebody to, you know, is organizations to, to sort of take Salesforce, try to run with it, and say like, well, this this doesn't this doesn't do what we needed to do, and then and then f say like, well, Salesforce isn't friendly enough, or it's not a it's not a tool that's fit for us. The reality is, it's like putting, you know, it's a little bit like putting a 16 year old in a Lamborghini, right? If if you like, if you don't if you don't have experience with it or with a similar database platform. So, the good news is, um, there's a really good place to start with um, with Trailhead. So I'm not going to go in and do like a full demo of Trailhead, but well worth uh, take, taking a peek at it. And it's a, if you want to learn more about Salesforce, it is honestly the best place to, to start because they've got trails uh, and modules at all different levels for you to be able to see, OK, I want to you know, be, I want to learn to be a, an administrator. That used to mean you had to go for a week-long training out in stains, you know, and like it's full, right? And, so, and it's not really geared at the nonprofit use case. Whereas actually they've got trails specifically designed for the nonprofit success pack. They've got trails specifically designed for administrators or for even for impact measurement. Um, so this is a really good place to, to start if you want to try to learn Salesforce. And, and you, you'll get a kind of a, a, a sandbox you know, space where you can kind of tinker with things. And it's really important to be able to do that without affecting your, your users. So yeah, so that's kind of my overall message. It, AMP isn't gonna AMP isn't gonna like uh, change that. It's actually gonna it's gonna turn your it's gonna soup up your Lamborghini into, you know, w with like a turbo engine or something, right? Like, so it's awesome if you've got the the sort of 
skill or, or kind of experience or uh, a partner that can help you make the most of it. Um, but it'll be even more intimidating, I would say, if, if, uh, if you don't have that kind of help. Another thing you can check out is Salesforce Mums. They're, it's spun out of, a, of another Salesforce partner here in London um, called Economic Change, and they've, they've created a, it's a Mums who are kind of coming back to their, the, uh, you know, part-time to, to work, and they've specialized in, in Salesforce, and that tends to be uh, a little bit l cheaper than consulting with, let's say, like us or consulting with uh, another partner, uh, like another partner directly. Uh, and you will find pro bono, folks who will work pro bono. I, I, will, I will sort of throw it out there that like I, we, we have probably in our, in our eight, year, uh, eight years of doing this, we've probably cleaned up 30 different systems that are just the legacy of a bad pro bono implementation or just a bad implementation for that, for that matter, uh, maybe, maybe more. Uh, and the, the problem, it's just, it's important to have, for people to have a stake in the success of, of, the, of the project. So just be, uh, it's awesome, like there are people out there, but just be a little bit wary and skeptical. Yeah. Salesforce mums. Yeah, if you if you Google that, you can find. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the the reality actually, this is this is one of these things where there isn't one way to structure it. So for, so for some organizations, programs are here and projects are here, and there's a hierarchical relationship between programs and projects. And for other organizations, it's actually that programs are here and projects are here, and there's a like a junction relationship where multiple projects will be will cover multiple programs and vice versa. And so there, AMP doesn't give you one way of solving it. It basically says. Here's a structure that's, that's common in terms of what people need for indicator management, log frames, activities, I skipped activities, um, uh, you know, performance tracking. And then you can kind of build onto it or enhance it to, to get the structure that you need. So if that means you've got, if you need a hierarchical structure, you can do that. If that means you want to just have a project that links to a program, that's like what you have, that's what you have in this example here. Um, you know, where you've got a program here that's the education program, right? Um, but you could also have, you know, you could also have uh, more of a hierarchy to that, right? You could have, in Plan's case, you have education and then Kenya education, right? And then this specific project that sits under that. In other cases, you've got, you know, program structured in a different way, right? Aga Khan Foundation was a fascinating case where they decided to define a program as the intersection of a theme that they're working on, seven different themes, um, and a geog and like a, a province that they're working in. Um, so they, just to give you a little bit of visibility into, this is kind of what they had pre-AMP, which probably looks a little familiar. So good old, good old try to get Excel, you know, Excel reports in from everybody. These are the different themes that they work on. And then all that starts coming into, into Salesforce. You have a consistent structure for, in their case, their, you know, 88 indicators that are being reported on across their 17 countries. Uh, and the programs are kind of each province and each theme, right? And so that's kind of, for them, there isn't one way that an organization conceptualizes, here's how we think about a program or a project. Uh, and AMP isn't going to sort of tell you how to, how to do it. It's going to give you a structure that is flexible to work the way that you need it to. All the more reason why it is important to have a partner to kind of help you, help you make the most of it. We still have an unanswered question around data viz. Mm. I, I, I touched on it a little Quick bit before. Yeah. Amp, can it be used with Classic or is it only Lightning? It can be used in both, yeah. Yeah, although Salesforce is going to start to move, no. force people to move on to Lightning, so just be, be wary of that. It, we, I, I will confess, like, we just made the move ourselves. We've been, you know, on Salesforce since 2010, same system. It's evolved a little bit over the years. <coughs> and, man, it was really, you know, as, as somebody who's designing Lightning systems for people, it was really hard for me to just, like, get, you know, get off of Classic and, and onto Lightning, but it, it, really is, it really is just a better way of, it really is a better way of working. There are things that you just can't do in Classic that you can do in Lightning that, uh, are, uh, you know, are really kind of game changing. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's, um, that's, that's kind of this AKF case. And this is kind of a, the integration point, you know, this, they're working with ArcGIS. So they use AMP to really kind of bring that data together in the system. And then they're able to push it out to ArcGIS to do the mapping, right? If you, if you worked backwards from, okay, we want to use ArcGIS for mapping, like, therefore we should use ArcGIS for data management. No, like, and so we see organizations making these kinds of these kinds of kind of questionable decisions around technology, where you have like one feature in mind, and you end up making a bad decision around the stack, like the overall uh, the set of technologies that that you're using, um, just because like it can't do mapping, right? And in Salesforce, it can do mapping, but it's not this kind of you know fancy fancy mapping. So the answer is you know work with a technology that can integrate well with with other technologies. 
Um, on that note, I'll skip over the, the Shell Foundation case study. It's more of the, oh crap, Excel, uh, and uh, you know, now, we, now, we have, uh, now we have AMP and we're managing the data that way. Um, so these are, the, these are kind of the things, I, I, so I'll leave, I'll leave you with this and we can certainly do a little bit more Q&A, but um, these are kind of the common things that I've seen organization, we've seen organizations needing over the years. Everything kind of falls into these buckets from, from my perspective. So first, it's a question of what are our needs now? And so if we're looking for technology for uh, impact measurement or project management or program management, even just for CRM, I, I, you know, I think this, this really applied. So what are our needs now? And that breaks down into your features, your user friendliness, uh, the security of, of that tool. Then it's really important to answer the question of what do we think, at least, what do we think our future needs will be? So what are our needs three or four years from now? And the answer is always going to be like, well, we're not really sure, but I bet you know, we're going to need some, some of this or some of that. And you'll be able to anticipate that. That's where flexibility, interoperability, and the ecosystem of a tool come into play and are really, really important in terms of working out what tool you want to you go with. Uh, and I would say in this space, this is where Salesforce really, really happens to excel, is that flexibility and interoperability and the, the ecosystem. And the last thing is around cost. And I, this is, um, as, somebody, as somebody who kind of runs a, runs a company, never really sort of learned how to run a company, have just sort of picked, <laughs> tried to pick it up over, over the years. Uh, often we don't think about, like uh, psych human psychology gets us to think about costs in the wrong ways, and this is the right way to think about costs. You think about the total cost of ownership over a certain period of time. It could be five years, it could be four years, it could be two years, but think of, set a time in the future and say, what's going to be the total cost of ownership over option one versus option two versus option three? And that's going to break down into the setup cost, into the license fees, uh, and then into the ongoing cost or kind of the maintenance, the, the maintenance cost. And literally, like, everything is an option here, right? Excel, you can do Excel, right? You'll, you'll end up in the same place that I was in in 2008, which is basically death by Excel, which is the features aren't, aren't great. The user friendliness is pretty good because everybody knows how to use it. The security uh, seems like, probably seems like it's okay, but let's be honest, it's actually crap, right? Like, it's not, it's not a secure, just because you put a password on your Excel sheet doesn't mean that it's secure. Um, the... You know, the flexibility is, you know, yes, you can add more columns, but what happens when you have to version, version that spreadsheet and you have changes you need to make? The interoperability is actually okay. The ecosystem is fantastic because lots of people know, know Excel, so that's really good. Uh, the setup cost is going to be something. The license costs are going to be negligible. And the maintenance cost, the ongoing cost, is going to be everybody in your organization ripping their hair out, or at least, <laughs> you know, at least one or two people ripping their hair out because they're the, they're the data person. Um, so you can do it with Excel, you can do it with Salesforce, you can do it with you know, Dynamics or, or, or other kinds of tools. But I find that this, this approach is kind of nice. You can, you can feel free to use this if you want to, but so if, if, you, if you say like, okay, actually I kind of I buy that approach. These seem like a good enough set of things that I'm interested in, in considering. What you can do is use a decision matrix like this. So you say, okay, here's you know, the features, the user friendliness, the security, the flexibility, the interoperability, the ecosystem, and then you don't have to take these weights, but apply weights that you think are appropriate for your organization for what's going to be the most important thing for shaping the, the business value, the weighted score of, of what tool is the best, and then work out the total cost of ownership. You're going to have to do your best to estimate this, but the total cost of ownership over five years. A tool like Salesforce is going to have a bigger setup cost and it's going to have some license fees, but the maintenance costs are going to be probably lower than a tool that is kind of DIY uh, within your organization. Um, so, I've, I've found this to be helpful when people kind of ask me for advice on like what tool should we use for X. Um, yeah, and that's, that's my two cents. Thanks guys. Thank